thanks, Ty, for giving me the chance. Thanks, everybody, for showing up to fake your interest in this sort of stuff. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Coin Trader is every geek's fantasy project. We're going to make an automatic money making machine. That's the idea. We're yeah. trading uh, cryptocurrency um, algorithmically. This is not going to be pretty JavaScript graphs, it's going to be a command line, it's going to be data dumps. Uh, Tom's going to show you some bar graphs and analysis, and uh, that's what we find exciting. So CoinTrader, it's an open source uh, project. Um, most people don't give away financial software, but uh, this is sort of foundational and there's nothing proprietary here too much, so I think it benefit from the community approach. We can all put our proprietary strategies on top of it, but the foundation, I think, needs to be shared and reliable. So that's why I started this project. Um, you can find it on GitHub. It's under Tim Olson Coin Trader, just like that. Um, let's see. Okay, so let's jump right into it. Let's show you some action. Uh, there's a couple different one run modes. Uh, to build Coin Trader, you need Java. That's about it. Maven is the build tool. Uh, if you just git clone the project, uh, run Maven, you're good to go. Uh, you need MySQL or any other database, JDBC adapter. Um, the first thing you want to do is this, uh, save data run mode, you just basically run it in the background, it goes out, now it's collecting data from a bunch of different exchanges, saving it to the database. This runs sort of as a daemon, you just fire it up right away, let it go, don't worry about it. How many exchanges? Uh, so, right now I think it's only pulling about four. Uh, but I rely on a different project for the actual exchange adapters, and I'll show you that as well. It's very easy to pull the other project's drivers, if you will, into CoinTrader. Um, so dozens at that point. Uh, if you're willing to do just a little bit of work, I'll, show, I'll give you a quick peek at what that looks like. Um, let's kill this process because I already have one going. So, cool stuff. Console. So thanks to Simon for suggesting the REPL type interface. Uh, so we have a little command line tool here to just peek into the engine with a bunch of commands. Um, let's see, this is what we're connected to now. It looks like I got five exchanges in there. And just some terminology. Um, currency pairs I call listings um, to differentiate from markets. Markets are a currency pair on a specific exchange. Whereas a listing is just sort of a generic currency pair that you might buy anywhere. This is important because when you start to do arbitrage, the price of that listing is going to be different on different exchanges. And so it's important to make that distinction. So I, I talk about markets, listings, and exchanges. Okay? Just terminology. Um, the point of this really is to collect a bunch of data, dump it out to an analysis tool, CSV file or something like that. Do your analysis, develop a strategy, and then implement it in, in sort of an uh, event responsive kind of way. Uh, so one of the first things you want to do is probably dump out some ticks like this. Um, I'm not going to do that, it takes a few minutes, but this is sort of what it looks like. It just gives you a dump of uh, the exchange it found, the prices, and the book all the way out to 100 deep on either side. A, a book, if you don't know book terminology, uh, in order book, when people place a limit order on market, that is, they place an order that has a, a price bound on it, um, it may not get filled right away, so that goes on to what's called a book. And so exchanges uh, hold an order book of all the offers people have made to buy or sell those listings. So that's what a book is. Um, 100 deep, like Bitcoin, or 100 deep pairs of orders? So 100, 100 deep orders on the book. So that's just what the CSV is printing out now. Some of the books on these exchanges are much deeper than 100 orders, um, which is great. Uh, sometimes it's shallower, and you can't count on there be, being any orders, actually, because sometimes volume is very thin, and uh, there's uh, just no orders on the book because somebody just made a trade that cleared all those orders. How many people are following finance terminology? Should I, should I give a little more? Sort of? Uh -huh. OK. Um, all right, I'll, I'll try to keep it not too technical. Um, okay, so um, let's see some data here. Uh, just set a little watch here. And consoles aren't great for watching data. Really would love to be a graph, but just to show you that we're getting stuff in here. These are, this is the price range here. You see uh, 579 to 582. That's called a spread. 
Um, so if you wanted to buy Bitcoin on BTC there, uh, you would have to pay 582, but if you wanted to sell it right away, you would only get 579 for it. So there's a gap there that's called the spread. Um, and that's very important to understand when you want to trade. Uh, so let's just show some data coming in. Uh, let's, let's try a buy. Now, this isn't actual live buying. What I'm going to show you is mock order execution. Uh, we have a plugin here that looks at the incoming orders from the market data and it simulates whether your order would have been filled by the data it sees coming in. Um, so that's what you're going to see today is simulated fills, just to be clear. So let's buy a Bitcoin. Um, let's just one. <laughs> I'm gonna do a, I'm gonna do more. Uh, actually, I'm gonna do less than one just for the first. Uh, <laughs> Make some money. Make some money. Uh, so um, it created an order here, up, oh, and it filled it pretty quick. Uh, this is a market order. I didn't put a limit on it. Um, you can do something like this limit. Uh, What's a limit order? So sorry. Thank you. Um, a limit order is where you. You say you want to buy Bitcoin, but you don't want to pay more than a certain price. Or you want to sell Bitcoin, but you don't want to sell it for less than a certain amount. So you can add a limit using 590. I'm not going to pay more than 590. And that's going to should clear pretty quick. I think it's in the price range. Yeah. So that, that filled right away because 590 is well above where the market's at right now. But if it were below, it would just sit on the order book. That that limit order until somebody came around who was willing to sell me. Uh, Bitcoin at 590. One tenth of Bitcoin. Sorry? One tenth of a Bitcoin. One tenth of a Bitcoin. <laughs> so, um, uh, so volume is also very important. I'm going to show you that. So, uh, you'll notice here that this created one specific order to directly to a specific market, uh, and it was filled directly. Uh, because it's only one tenth of a Bitcoin, it can be one small order and clear. But if we want to buy a hundred Bitcoins. If we're greedy, um, there's probably not one person out there with 100 bitcoins waiting for you to buy. So whoa, here we go. We got a bunch of fills. Um, so this is important to understand. To get the whole volume of one bitcoin, it had to. Sorry, what I order 100. <laughs> um, it had to grab orders at different prices. So this first order you see was at 582.09, and it got 1.7 Bitcoins at that price. And then it got 1.43 Bitcoins at 582.09. And then it had to raise the price a little bit to get the next amount of Bitcoins, because there's just not enough people offering Bitcoins at the price you want. So this is called eating through the order book. So when you place a large order, you're, you're going like this to a bunch of orders, and that costs you a little bit of money. The more orders you try to grab, you kind of have to pay a premium because you want them now. Is that called slippage? Uh, it, s s no. <laughs> um, uh, slippage is when you, you place an order, in, uh, a market order, and you think you're going to get one price, but you get a different price because the market has moved against you during the time it takes to place the order and fill it. So it's a little bit different, but a very similar effect. You don't always get the price you think you're going to get. So limit yeah. order also. If you place limit order and the uh, price is moving fast and there's no liquidity, limit order turns into a market order, correct? And then uh, you get whatever the next available price is. Uh, no, a stop order. That's a stop order. Oh. Yeah. Uh, a limit order should always fill at your limit or better. It should, uh, oh, I see, yes. Yeah. Um, so there's something called a stop order. I'm not going to talk about that. Tonight. So can tr coin trader place orders on or spread it across multiple exchanges to take advantage of extra debt? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it can. Thank you very much. I'll give you your money after the show. <laughs> so, um, so let's do that. Let's, let's buy 10 Bitcoins. And now, before I specified an exchange, I specified a specific market. But if I don't care, uh, where it buys it, I, I don't have to specify it. And Coin Trader will just look at the existing order books and route it to the cheapest exchange. That's not real smart about this yet, but it, it does a basic job. So if we go back in this order here, here it creates a general order instead of a specific order. Uh, a general order means, you know, 
fulfill my intent. I'm not telling you exactly what to do, I'm telling you kind of what I want. And so here, it decides that Bitstamp is going to be the cheapest place to fill your order, and it routes it there. Is the fact that it wrote about $3 a reflection of the actual trading price? This is live data. So what we're doing now is called paper trading or walk forward trading, where we have a simulated uh, matching engine, but it's actual live data coming from the exchanges. So this could have happened if I had placed a real trade. And it uh, looks like, yes, the market is moving. It moved about three bucks. Um, that can also happen because I am buying a significant amount here, and so it has to dive deep into that order book to get the complete fill. Um, so I want to show this uh, to show off order routing, and also that you, know, uh, you need to break up orders a lot of times into multiple fills. You can get partial fills. Um, you know, there's a lot to uh, think about and understand with the writer strategy. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but just to, you know, get you get you guys into it. Question? Yes. Uh, did you say you got filled at Bitstamp because it was a better price? So uh, does that mean you could get filled by Bitstamp, BTCE, or whoever is better? Good, good question. So uh -huh. currently the way CoinTrader works is that it just looks for the cheapest price and it doesn't think much about volume yet when it routes your order, um, and it does not oversubscribe. That means it puts your whole order on one exchange to try to fill it. It doesn't speculatively put orders on a bunch of exchanges and wait for the first best price and then cancel the others. Right. That's a, that's do, you, a, do you need a, um, funds on all the exchanges? Yes. Yeah, you have to have funds on all the exchanges. I see. Yep. Um, CoinTrader doesn't fund your account for you. <laughs> 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 so like, um, Thanks. So an upgrade to the service would be like uh, a, a centralized place that's accepting orders from all the exchanges. Yeah, you could think of CoinTrader actually as like that. So a platform that. to that. Yeah, it's kind of like a platform that can do that. Uh, yes. When we plug in the adapters and, you know, well, you I'm have only accounts. Thinking, I'm only thinking about how many, uh, how many places I can sell a share. Uh, you know, I could go to the New York Stock Exchange. Yes. I can go to Manage. I can go to Arca Book, yeah. uh, et cetera. Right. And there's probably like 17 different places, but I do it from one account. Okay, so. So this leads into a good point. Um, these are not exchanges, technically. They're not objective third-party matchmakers. They are involved. They're actually broker dealers. I did not want to call these exchanges in my project. I did it because it's common terminology in this industry. But these exchanges are trading against you. They may not give you real data. You don't know. They're your adversary. These are not regulated. Uh, they are not objective. Uh, they have skin in the game, they're trading their own accounts, they're broker dealers, they're not exchanges. Um, so, no, there is no centralized location, you know, uh, like NYSE where you trade cryptocurrencies. It's distributed and you're trading against other players in the game, uh, so be careful. <laughs> so, if there were just two exchanges, let's call them Bitstamp and Mt. Gox. For example. For example. <laughs> And you had you had five Bitcoin at each end. Yep. What would keep the program from saying, "Oh, look, the price on one of them is better. I'm going to move all your Bitcoins over to Mt. Cox." Okay. So uh, currently, CoinTrader doesn't move between accounts, or like it to do that. Eventually, maybe soon. Uh, but right now, it looks at your account balance on each exchange and matches. Make sure you can fill the order, and then finds the cheapest option within that subset. Makes sense. It doesn't move your money from one place to another. It'll just use your money on this exchange to buy if this exchange is cheaper. If this exchange is cheaper, it uses the money over here to buy. But it won't move them between. Okay. Got what, it. Yet. what happens if it has enough funds in total, but not enough in you know, the optimal it, it place? It will reject the order. That's, um, it can't clear it. Um, I'd love to make it more sophisticated. I'm telling you where it's at right now. Um, you know, order clearance. Algorithms are high-tech proprietary stuff that Wall Street holds close to the best, and um, I'll be building one when you know the foundation is stable. Um, there's a lot to think about. How do you manage your money? How do you break up an order into pieces to hide it? Uh, you know, how do you distribute it out through time to get the best uh, you know price and not pay too much for liquidity? There's a lot of uh, things to think about. 
Tim, were you a trader before? Um, I've traded my own account uh, in real life. I've done a little bit of algorithmic trading in real life. I've always been fascinated by finance, and I've lived in New York for 14 years. <laughs> uh, but I, I couldn't quite make the jump to Wall Street culture. So I saw this as an opportunity to get in the game, uh, sort of an end around, right? Um, to build a hedge fund, you need a lot of experience, a long track record, but hey, nobody's got that in cryptocurrency, so. <laughs> okay. um. <laughs> so are, you are you also doing, I, I couldn't see all the pairs that you had, but um, it, is it just Bitcoin or? Um, yeah, all kinds also of. Also Dogecoin and Litecoin and. All of those. So um, this is a list of some of the data I've collected. You can see there's different currency pairs here. Uh, but there's, it's not really limited by CoinTrader. Um, you know, CoinTrader needs to know the basis of it. There's a, there's a few small things you need to tell CoinTrader so they can trade a currency pair. Um, I'm not sure I should. Let, let's talk about data collection a little bit. Sure. Um, it's, uh, um, Okay, so first thing you'd want to do when you build an algorithmic trading system is get good data, uh, fast data. Uh, none of the exchanges have it. All the exchanges make you query uh, polling style uh, to request data, request data, request data. So people end up slamming it. Um, so the exchanges tend to cache those data feeds. So what you're seeing is usually 15, 30 seconds delayed um, from what the actual trades are. And if we go back up to where I was doing the watch here, um, uh, oh, we don't have a good example. Sometimes you'll see a whole batch of trades come in at once. Now that doesn't mean they all execute at the same time. That just means we heard about them at once in a batch format. They may have happened over 20 or 30 seconds, but we get it in one big chunk. Nothing you can do about it. That's the way the exchanges feed out their data right now. Um, so one of the important things CoinTrader does is it records the time the event happened separately from the time we received it. So we can start to do analysis about the, the delays on the data transmission. And we can understand whether we're trying to act on the stale data or whether we've got really up to the minute data that's immediately action. And that's the time the exchange reported it has. Yeah, so the exchange reports a time, that's the server time, usually to the second. Uh, sometime, yeah, usually to the second. And then we record to the millisecond when it hits the hour server. Um, Another thing to be careful about when you're doing finance is amounts. Everyone saw Superman 2 where they put fractions of a penny into a separate account, I guess. No, maybe not. So uh, okay. when you're trading on exchange, you can't just say, I want to increment the price by 0 0.0000000001. That's not a valid step unit. Uh, so every listing, uh, sorry, every market, um, has a basis uh, that it trades in, whether it's a penny or a satoshi or something like that. Swiss francs, for example, are settled to the nearest nickel. So if you have 1.06 Swiss francs, they round it to 1.05. Okay, if you have 1.03, they round it up to 1.05. Um, so to deal with this uh, basis situation, Point Trader uses something called a discrete amount. I won't, I won't get into it too much, but we basically record the smallest step size that you can make in each currency and within each market. Um, so that if you want to bid one more than the other guy, you got to know how much one more is. It's not always the same. Even for the same listing, it may not be a Satoshi. Uh, Beter, for example, has a minimum buy amount of 0 0.0001. It's not a Satoshi, it's like thousand Satoshis or 10,000 Satoshis, so you need to be aware of those issues. CoinTrader records all that, manages it, helps you work with it in the scheme. Um, okay, so let's talk about something else. Um, okay, so we've got some data. I want to talk a little bit about event handling. Now that we've got all this data sucked into the system, we dumped it to a CSV. Tom, Tom did some great analysis on his graphs. Now we need to react to the data. CoinTrader uses a project called Esper, E-S-P-E-R. If you haven't heard of it, it's great for a lot of projects. It's a super at time series analysis, where you want to look at sort of a sliding window of time or batch windows of time. 
and ex uh, extract events from those time ranges. Is that like stream based? Sorry? Is it like stream based? I don't know stream based. Um, I know Esper. <laughs> so, Esper, codehouse.org. Um, uh, if you haven't seen it, I think you should check it out anyway. It lets you do things like this. It kind of looks like SQL, but when they say they're selecting the average price from a stock tick event with a 30 second time window, um, that is getting triggered every time a new trade event, stock tick event in this case, gets published into the Esper engine. This statement immediately gets updated, recalculates, and will trigger your code. Um, so uh, you can see how here how this would be useful for stock events when you want to sort of describe a situation of a time series that you want to trigger on or that you want to analyze somehow. You can write an Esper statement to sort of capture those conditions. Um, then in CoinTrader, you bind it to a Java method with this simple annotation that CoinTrader provides called when. This is an Esper statement. And what this does is it basically says, anytime we get an order book into the system, call this method. It's as easy as that. So the way CoinTrader interacts with the incoming data is through an immediate event trigger based on Esper select statements. Um, so you can do all kinds of things with Esper. I'm not going to go deep into it. I encourage you to check it out online. Um, it's a How's very it mature project, E-S-P-E-R. Anytime you have a time series analysis or you want to react immediately to event data, uh, it's something to consider. Let me, while I'm talking about frameworks, let me also show you the exchange framework. CoinTrader builds on this other project, Tim Moulter, different Tim, exchange. Uh, if you're writing a trading book, trading bot and you think coin traders are too heavy or you have code already and you just want to plug in straight to the exchanges, this is what you want. These are sort of driver level adapters to all the different exchanges. So ANX, Atlas Sats, BitBay, Bitcoin Average, Bitcoin Charts. I mean, it goes on and on. It's a lot of work, a lot of people in this project. These are not bug free adapters. <laughs> um, but they will be eventually. You know, uh, it's an open source project, and there's there's a lot of people working on it. So CoinTrader builds on top of this. Are they all Java? This is all Java. Yes. Um, so the way CoinTrader pulls in Exchange is pretty easy. Um, <clears throat> to pull in an Exchange, you just do something like this. You, you tell it which adapter class you need from the ex Exchange package. You tell it what the query rates are and you tell it what listings you want to watch. So if anyone wants to add um, exchanges to CoinTrader, it's fairly straightforward. I encourage it as, a, as an early starting project to get involved. Let's see, what else do you want to talk about? Tom has the really cool stuff in the analysis and stuff, so I'm going to keep this pretty short. Um, let me just show you this demo strategy real quick. Uh, so here I wrote, very simple strategy, the idea behind the strategy is we're going to put in order one, we're, uh, we're going to buy for one unit cheaper than the other, than anyone else on the market, and we're going to sell for one unit more than anybody else on the market, that's the idea. It doesn't work great, but just, just to show you something. Um, so anytime a book comes in, books have the data of what the offers are on either side, I bid and ask. Um, uh, it gets the best bid and best ask, records them, and then it tells uh, the simple stateful strategy uh, that it's ready to trade and that it can enter or exit a trade after it has some data. That's all this method sort of does. The simple stateful strategy just keeps track of whether you're warming up the strategy to collect data, whether you're in a trade, or whether you're out of a trade. It's just a simple state machine. And then here we just say how we get in and out of a trade. Um, here I show off the discrete amount class. Um, it gets the best bid price and it decrements it. This gives you the, again, the smallest unit you can move against the other people. Um, same thing on the exit order. We find the best sell price and then we try to sell it for one more. Um, so we can try this strategy in the console. I don't know if it's going to work great, but... So, so it, it got a book, it created an order. It looks like it's trying to buy 
um, at 586.37. So if it ever drops a little bit, I don't know if it'll fill. Could you bump the text size a little bit on the journal? Yeah. Oh, nice. Back. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I don't know if it's going to clear, actually. I can't control the market for the demo, so this is a terrible strategy. It's, uh, it's going to get into it. If, if the market moves sort of one direction, it's going to get in the trade and never be able to exit it. This sort of, this sort of strategy wants the, you know, the market to move up and down so that it keeps hitting its buy-sell on either side of the, the board, if that makes sense. Okay, so um, that's kind of coin trader. Uh, the fun stuff is what yeah. Tom has to say with all the analysis and that sort of stuff. This is, this is infrastructure, right? This is middleware. This helps you gather data, analyze it, dump it, create triggers on signals, uh, develop your own signals, and uh, simulate trading in a sandbox environment, and eventually live trade. That's the whole point of coin trader. So, um, fully open space. Oh, can can you randomize the amounts or uh, or the or the quantities that they are that you're selling? Uh, can you can you randomize the quantities that you're selling? So it, so sure. it's not clear that it's you selling over and over again. Yeah yeah that's a that's an important strategy right when you when you have a large order um, you don't want to put one big order on the book uh, mm -hmm. people will see that and exploit it they'll front run you all kinds of things uh, so usually what's done you break it up into small random pieces yeah and you don't put them all in the book. Right away, anyway, you'll string them out through time. You'll put them on different exchanges. You know, you want to you want to take a large order, crumble it into little pieces, and just scatter them everywhere. It makes it difficult to see that you're a big player. That's an important. That's an important thing. Any other questions? Uh, BTC, for instance, is here consistently lower than most others. Yeah, that could be a bug. Is there a oh, okay. yeah? I don't know. Is there a simple way to? It, it, costs, it costs more money to put fiat and BTC, so that's one of the reasons why it's always lower price. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, yeah, uh, when Mt. Gox was in trouble, they were consistently lower as well because of the risk premium, basically. Um, I don't know if that's true with BTC or not. Apparently, there's a larger fee off of so the transfer. You're saying that most exchanges give time values in seconds? Are there any that you I remember that give five range amount? Um, I, not that I remember. Okay, so seconds basically as low as the <clears throat> For trade times. That's mostly what I've seen. Um, since we use the exchange adapter, I haven't looked real closely at that level of detail. Um, but it is important to go through that level of detail and understand it before you trade on a specific exchange. That's one reason I don't have all the exchanges in CoinTrader that exchange provides. I want to review each one and make sure it's working. And, you know, you have to sample the data and validate it. You know, 